The sacrum, right, the sacrum. So in, in humans, in us bipedal animals that have elected to stand upright, the sacrum is probably more important than other animals. The bones of the vertebral column are weird and the bone of the sacrum, which is formed from multiple bones, um, is even weirder. But for us, at the weight of our torso, our upper limbs and our head goes down through the vertebral column into the sacrum and then into the pelvis. Whether we're sitting, but more so when we're walking, um, all of this load is transferred to the sacrum. So it is a big, strong bone. So we will look at the shape, the parts, the lumpy, bumpy bits, the interesting bits, the nerves that come out of it, spinal cord, you know, general, general sacrum stuff. So the sacrum is this wedge of bone down here in between the two halves of the pelvis, as it were. The pelvis itself is made up of three bones. Anyway, this is the ilium. We'll get to that. Um, would you like a bit of Latin or Greek? Of course you would. So the Greek word for this bone is hieron. Hieron? Hieron? Um, and then that got kind of translated into Latin um, so that this became the sacred bone. Like maybe it's involved, used to be involved in, um, or like used to be the sacred part of the animal in sacrifices or where the soul of man resides, I don't know, something like that. But there is an idea that maybe it was mistranslated and uh, when Galen described it as the strong bone, which to be honest, that, that, that kind of makes sense because it is a very strong bone. And that's why in the rest of the vertebral column we see these individual vertebrae and down here at the level of the sacrum, sacrum there were also five individual vertebrae and certainly by my age they have all fused together to make a single very strong bone and the coccyx these little tiny bones hang down here underneath look we can get a sense of of these vertebrae by some of the shapes we can see we can see these spinous processes reflected here we can see these foramina, kind of the, of the intervertebral foramina, but they're a little bit different here. And um, it's also got a heck of a curve to it. A real big curve, and there's a big kind of direction change between the last lumbar vertebra and the first sacral vertebra, or the sacrum as a whole. So it is a really, really curved shape. So we'll have a look at all of this, but it's the, so these are the bones of the ilium on either side, and you can, you can palpate these, right? And uh, the sacrum then is kind of forming like this very strong wedge shape. So the top half, look, the top half is weight bearing. The top half is interacting with, it's kind of intercalated with, it's, it's a very interesting joint shape, which is integral to its function. So the top half of the sacrum is very much load bearing at this joint between the sacrum and the ilium. So all of this load, even when you're sitting down, is pushing out into the pelvis. You know, if you were designing or building something like this, you, it's a pretty good way of doing it, right? Um, and all of this is tied together with very strong ligaments and what have you. And then the sacrum is a point which muscles attach to and, and so on. Okay, let's have a look at the shape. Look at that, that's, that's a heck of a curve it's got to it. So the anterior surface of the sacrum is forming like the, the posterior wall and the lateral, posterolateral walls of the pelvis. Um, uh, there it is there, but look inside. So that bowl shape that we see, that bowl shape that is made is largely formed by the, that curving of the sacrum. So that shape's really, really important. And we can see the holes there. You can also see the ligaments up here that are tying it all together. Uh, and there's the L5 bone there. So, the L5 vertebral body has an intervertebral disc between it and the sacrum. The sacrum is formed from five sacral vertebrae and they had little intervertebral discs between them too and all of that ossifies. So when growth is kind of finishing in late adolescence, 
uh, we start to see uh, these bones fusing together and certainly by your late 20s, early 30s, all of these bones have fused into a single sacrum. There is some variability there, but most people, um, you know, they have a fused, single fused bone like this. And we can see one, two, three, four posterior foramen, foramina, on either side. And if I turn it around, we can see one, two, three, four anterior, anterior foramen, foramina. Um, so what's happening here is the spinal cord runs through the vertebral canal, right? And spinal nerves leave it um, through the intervertebral foramen, which is actually a gap between two vertebrae. Each vertebra has like half a hole and you put them both together. And down here, um, like the, 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 the L5 spinal nerve will leave inferior to the L5 vertebra. And the, the, actually the spinal cord ends at about, you know, L1, L2 levels. And then running down the vertebral canal, we actually have the spinal nerves. They run down and then they leave at the point they're supposed to leave at. So down here we have the chorda equina, the horse's tail, because it's a bundle of spinal nerves running down the vertebral canal. And that vertebral canal also exists inside the sacrum. Here, the posterior bone of the sacrum has been taken away, so we can see the chorda equina. Um, and this is the sacral canal. So the spinal nerves are leaving through these foramina. But uh, how good are you at spinal nerve stuff? In the spinal cord, you have the ventral and dorsal roots come together to form a spinal nerve, which is mixed. But then it, it branches, it gives off a posterior ramus to the deep muscles of the back, and it gives off an anterior ramus, which is which are these nerves that we tend to talk about all the time, like your, your, your whatever, your sciatic nerve, your intercostal nerve, your brachial plexus, those are all the, the anterior rami, right? So a spinal nerve, when it forms, it has two branches. One goes anteriorly, one goes posteriorly. Ah, so the holes in the sacrum make more sense now. So we have the spinal cord, or rather the chorda equina, running through the sacral canal, and then the spinal nerves give off their anterior and posterior rami. And what we see here inside the pelvis is we see those anterior rami leaving through the anterior foramina and passing into the pelvis. And that's where uh, the pedendal nerve comes from, that's where the sciatic nerve comes from, that's where those, those guys that we tend to talk about a lot come from. But these foramina that we see posteriorly then, remember the chorda equina is in there, the spinal nerve forms, and then the posterior ramus leaves the sacrum through these posterior foramina to get to the deep structures of the back. So, that's unusual about the sacrum is that we see four foramina on either side anteriorly and posteriorly and yeah if we look through them we can see they go all the way through but you kind of need to you kind of need to have that idea of call it a quina, spinal nerve then way going out through the two holes does that help or make it worse i don't know sorry the s5 spinal nerve actually kind of pops out inferior to all of that. That's why there are four holes in the sacrum. S1, S2, S3, and S4 come out through there anteriorly, and S5 comes out inferiorly. In fact, the, um, all right, <laughs> too much spinal cord stuff, but the spinal cord ends, as I said, up here at about L1, L2, but then it's like tethered by the phylum terminale. It's like tethered by a cord that runs down through the vertebral uh, canal and the sacral canal with the chorda equina. And that actually runs all the way down into the coccygeal bones and that's where it's anchored. So it, it's, yeah, I mean this, so it, can, it continues. The knowledge of these spaces is useful, but not obvious and difficult to dissect. So you've got to kind of imagine those spaces. Now, well, why is it useful? Well, clinically, 
Okay, here's the sacrum. Um, here, so this is where the sacrum would articulate with the coccygeal bones. There is actually an access point there. You could put a needle or a catheter in here, so at the base of the sacrum, and that would pass into the sacral canal. Your needle or your catheter would then access the space around those spinal nerves, around the corda equina in the sacral canal if you wanted to anesthetize those spinal nerves. All right, so how does that access point come about then? Why do we have this shape? All right, so if we look at the anatomy, the parts of the sacrum, we talked about this distinct curve, like I'm even, look there, I'm even tilting this madly, but there's the lumbar vertebrae there, and then there's that mad curve. Um, so this point here is the sacral promontory, this sticky outy bit, there's the L5 vertebral body, there's the intervertebral disc, so this would be the S1 vertebral body here, now forming the first part of, or the most superior part of the sacrum, and it's that sticky outy bit that is the sacral promontory, and then we have this curve. This is important obstetrically, because if we look inside the pelvis, we look at this lovely bowl shape. All right, all that bowl shape is formed by the curve, and look, there's the sacral promontory. So it is a narrowing, right? It's a, it's a narrow point between the pubis bones here and the vertebral column. The sacral promontory is kind of your, your limiter, right? Okay, the base of the sacrum is the widest point, so the superior part is the base, the wide bit. The apex of the sacrum is the inferior part, kind of the pointy bit down here. Um, the vertebrae have spinous processes, right? And these sacral vertebrae also had spinous processes. Well, vertebrae S1, S2, S3, and S4 did, but S5 did not. And the spinous process is attached by this lamina here, right, which is what makes the arch. So the S5 vertebra didn't have a spinous process, didn't have that lamina, which means there was access to this hole here. So that's what forms the sacral hiatus, this access point to the sacral canal is the lack of the spinous process and the, the lamina here. The, the remaining vertebrae, S1, S2, S3, and S4, their spinous processes form the median sacral crest, lumpy bit in the midline you can palpate, and then the, trans, uh, the transverse processes and bits and bobs out here, um, they persist as the lateral sacral crests, one on either side, also things you can kind of palpate. All right, and then, yeah, and then out here we have the, the joint. So sacral hiatus, median sacral crest, lateral sacral crests, posterior sacral foramina, anterior sacral foramina, the parts of the sacrum. So with the sacrum here, you can, it's, it's readily palpatable, isn't it? You can palpate a lot of this. So there's the median sacral crest, and then down here is that upside down U shape, uh, the, the bones around it helping you feel these lateral bits. These are the, the cornua. Um, so you can feel this upside down U shape, which makes the sacral hiatus and is a potential access point to the sacral canal in real people, but not in this plastic skeleton. Um, and look, these are the, these are the, the, the coccygeal bones here hanging down inferiorly. These guys are quite diddy, and these are what cause me to pause when students ask me how many vertebrae are there? Because sometimes there are three or four or five of these, and these guys lower down tend to fuse and, and, and so on, right? But they're, yeah. They're important because um, important muscles and ligaments actually use this as an attachment site. So the, the coccyx is, it's a really useful set of bones. The sacrum can be broader in many women. There are many different uh, pelvis types and shapes. And so in, in women, often the sacrum is wider because the pelvis is wider. In men, the S1 bone tends to be bigger, stronger, 
because men tend to be bigger and heavier, so this bears more load. So there are some differences between the genders there as well. Um, okay, what about joints then? The lumbosacral joint is the joint between the fifth lumbar vertebrae, L5, its body here, intervertebral disc here, and the S1 vertebra of the sacrum. Uh, the sacrum has these superior articular-like processes that articulate with the inferior articular processes of the L5 vertebra. So like the other vertebral joints, we have like a, like a facet joint there. Um, but the other thing to notice is like this, this pretty profound angle change here means that we don't have like a nice <clears throat> flat intervertebral disc that's like, yeah, happy all day long, taking that load, yeah, we're good. No, it's like, it's a wedge. Um, which means that the loads imposed upon it um, could, well, they will affect that intervertebral disc differently to intervertebral discs that have a much easier life because they're nice and flat and they just get squashed evenly, right? Um, but remember that the lumbosacral joint is also reinforced by lots of ligaments and what have you tying these vertebrae to the... To the sacrum, which I think we've covered elsewhere, we've done ligaments of the pelvis. Um, it's like a suspension bridge. So the sacrum is a wedge into the ilium, bones on either side, and then as it goes down, so these ligaments, then they're, they're under tension and they're holding it all together and what have you. Um, so if that's, the, if that's the lumbosacral joint here, the other major joint then is the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint, often gets abbreviated to SI joint, is a really interesting joint. So look at, look at the shapes that we have there. So the shape and the surfaces, kind of that interlocking thing that's going on here, is really important to the joint function. This is actually a synovial joint, you know, like the joint you'd find between bones that move a great deal. There is a little bit of movement here, the amount of movement is debated, um, and it's all, as I said, tied together by very, very strong ligaments. So, um, the, I mean, the articular or the cartilage of the articular surfaces isn't articular cartilage, but it does have a synovial capsule, it does have synovial fluid. Um, so it is a proper synovial joint with all the advantages and disadvantages that may bring. Um, so there is a little bit of movement here, but that, that interlocking nature, the two, the shapes of the surfaces and the way they go together is important to the joint function in that we're holding this together. It needs to be a very, very strong joint but it does need to allow a little bit of movement. Lastly, probably because of walking and the way the pelvis needs to move a little bit when we walk and move our lower limbs and that sort of thing. Today, we're talking about the sacrum itself and not all the joints. In fact, the sacroiliac joint, um, no doubt will be a video on its own in the future, but it is a source of low back pain. For example, during pregnancy, hormones cause ligaments to, to stretch a little bit more easily, easily a little bit, be a little, and then the, be a little bit more lax because that's important in childbirth. But also if this, this sort of thing is held together by strong ligaments and more movement is allowed, that can lead to inflammation and low back pain and that sort of thing. And, and big muscles are pulling on the pelvis and moving the lower limb and moving all of this sort of things. So you can see how it could get inflamed and irritated, particularly if it's a joint that's not supposed to move a great deal. So there you go. That's the anatomy of the sacrum. So the parts of the sacrum, that space inside it is important and how the nerves get out and how you might access it, the names of the bits and bobs. Um, and then we've talked about the sacroiliac joint and the lumbosacral joint. And the sacroiliac joint we might come back to again in the future, I think. Um, anywho, right, that'll do. Uh, see you next week. The sacrum. It's good, both.